morning, church. Let's stand and sing on this beautiful morning.
this morning for your goodness. I thank you that each one of us can look in our lives, Lord, and see your tangible goodness, your tangible kindnesses to us. And so we praise you for your goodness. And for those maybe who've come from a week where it's felt like scorched earth and not much good around, may each of our hearts be encouraged with the truth that no matter our week, Lord, you are good. You're gracious, you're gentle, you're compassionate. You know where we are. You're our refuge, and so we thank you for that. But, Lord, we also praise you as we've just sung that you are king. And we put our voices together with the psalmist in praising you for being king. We, we exalt you, our God and king, and we'll bless your name forever and ever. You are gracious and you are great. You're a great king above all gods. Your greatness is unsearchable. And one generation shall praise your name to another. And on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works this morning, we will meditate. We thank you for your goodness and your kindness. Be honored in this hour and in our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. I want to welcome you to Allen Bible Church. We're glad you're here to worship with us, uh, both in-house as well as if you are joining us online. If you are in-house and you're visiting with us, we've got a simple guest connect card. It says welcome in the one of the seats in front of you. If you'd fill that out and drop it in the uh, metal box on your way out of the double doors, that just helps us in our desire to welcome you uh, as well as we can, let you know a little bit more about us. Uh, and that's just a first step. We promise we're not a scary people, but we do, we do want to be a welcoming people. So that helps us in that. That's also where if you've come as part of your worship today to give, uh, you can drop a, a check in the, that metal box. There are four ways to give, actually. You can do that. You can text to give while we're here. There's info up there. Uh, you can go on our website, give online, or you can mail a check to our, uh, our church offices. We just praise God for his provision for our church and continue to thank you uh, in responding to him in worship and as a way of investing uh, in and through Allen Bible and the ministry that he's given us uh, locally as well as around the nations. Speaking of that, I had a great time of praying, uh, kind of a quarterly uh, prayer time for our ABC missionaries. Very encouraging uh, just to do that and to lift them up. They are ambassadors mostly from among us that got sent out, um, some in the U.S., but, but several overseas, and just a great time. Thanks to our our uh, missionary outreach um, team for putting that together. Uh, just one one big announcement for you in two weeks is uh, e- is Easter, but actually next Sunday begins Easter week services here. We'll have a Palm Sunday. Uh, will be next Sunday, and then Good Friday on the 15th. That's at 6.30 uh, in here. And then on Sunday morning, uh, Easter Sunday, it's at 10.30. I want to encourage you to invite friends and neighbors and family to join us. Um, we have one gathering at 1030, and so I want to encourage you to invite them now in the next few days to join you in worshiping here and then show up early that day um, so we can be ready to roll. just want to encourage you and invite you to join us there. And then lastly, um, we call this a worship gathering, not just a service, because we're really uh, worshiping all the time, whether we recognize it or not, beyond these walls. And we just collectively come together to be encouraged reminded and rehearse the truth of who God is uh, as we worship together. But we also gather at various times throughout the week to grow as his followers and disciples. So there's midweek discipleship that's happening Tuesdays um, for men in the morning and women in the morning. And then Wednesday nights, there's something for kids, for students, uh, for women and men. uh, And those are here except the men are at the office. Just encourage you to join us uh, there for those. At this time, speaking of our kiddos, if you're K through fourth, you're dismissed uh, to your ministry in the back. And if you would stand and let's continue to worship our King.
myself a lot lately um, to build my life uh, on God. Uh, you, I, all these things come at you. I've, I've had a job change. And I've found that um, every day has been somewhat of a blur, and I have to keep reminding myself and reminding myself, hey, let me build my life. Let me set my firm foundation this morning, today, this week on Christ. No matter what's happening, no matter how many directions I'm getting pulled, if I get away from that, then the world starts to crumble a little bit. Uh, and sometimes it can crumble a lot. So I, I don't know if that encourages anyone else here. So I'm going to please, um, let's, let's sing this because he is worthy. He's our provider. He's our protector. He's, he's given us breath and life today.
you so much um, for the cornerstone that is Jesus. And no matter what happens in the world around us, God, no matter what's going on in our hearts and our minds, Jesus is our foundation. He's firm and steadfast, never changing. Always with our best at heart. God, move us to stand on the rock. Help us, Lord, to lift our hearts, our minds, everything we have to, to you. I'm grateful, God, just for your mercy, and your grace, and your overwhelming love. Thank you for meeting us where we are. Thank you for the, the plan and purpose you have uh, for our lives. And help us, God, to know your voice, where you're leading and guiding us. That you would inform us no matter what's going on, that we would step into what you've called us to with boldness and with trust. Thank you for this morning, for the simplest thing of breath and life and the ability to gather. Thank you so much in Jesus' name. Amen. worship team uh, for leading us this morning. I'm, I'm captivated this morning by just how the body uh, reacts together, um, just how we get to worship together, be alongside one another, um, and that is really what our passage is this morning. And so I'm um, so thankful for the worship team, and if you didn't notice what was new, uh, Pete Bafoski is here hitting that box right there. Thank you, Pete, for doing that. Thank you. Pete and his wife, Amy, are relatively new with us, and um, I'm just thankful for the giftedness of everybody. Uh, also, this morning here is, is David Glover. Um, he is, um, it's been fun to get to know he and his wife and his kids and hope to hang with these guys even more uh, throughout the weeks and months and years as we continue to be the body of Christ together. But David's going to read our scripture for us this morning. Good morning. Today our scripture reading is coming from 1 Peter chapter 3. Verses 8 to 12. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. This is the word of the Lord today. Thank you, David. Look, I'm always uh, thrilled about people uh, in, within the church and using their giftedness. I hope that... Um, one day, Pete, you'll teach me how to hit that box. Man, I think I'd like to do that sometime. That looks fun to me. Uh, one of my favorite things to do here um, at this church is I have the opportunity um, working with our next generation, and um, I get to hang out with the littles, as I call them, you know, toddlers, because uh, they're super fun. And what I like about them, one of a bunch of things, but one of the things is they just have like a, they just got a different rule system from adults. You know what I'm saying? I go back there, hang with those guys, and... Um, even week, like week one, many weeks ago, um, I get a nickname. Uh, I get the nickname of Baldhead, all right? And um, I was tempted to go, hey, let me tell you about a verse out of Second Kings chapter 2, where there's a guy named Elijah, and there's these little kids, yeah, but we stayed from that, you know, because it's fun. And then my name changed to uh, Cuckoo Banana, and that's fun. And then it even extended even last week to Cuckoo Banana Smarty Teacher, uh, and I don't, oh, a smart teacher, and I, that, the tone didn't think, it, I didn't think it was a good thing, right? I don't think, I don't think that's what the intent was. Uh, but it's just super fun. Um, and, you know, the way that we do things around here, um, yeah, I, get, I can get a little choked up a little bit. I don't cry like Buddy cries, but I get choked. I get choked up. Um, just about the way um, that, you know, the Lord has called us, to get, called us together as a family uh, in Christ uh, brothers and sisters, we even, we'll even see some phrasing today talking about brotherly love. Um, last, 
Last Saturday was blessed. Uh, my wife and I, and really through the grace of God, was able to purchase a little house in this crazy market. I mean, it really is, it's a God story, but it's a, they just move right in there, but the house really legitimately stunk bad uh, because there's carpet been there since the 80s, I think. Uh, you know, so you take all that stuff up, and, and we just had a group of people come over last week just to help rip out baseboards and use their giftedness, and, and we were just blessed to be alongside of other believers here in this body uh, just working hand in hand. So thankful for the work that was done, but even more than that, thankful for, you know, the way that we got to know each other uh, through the process. Um, and today's passage really leads us to thinking through how we interact with each other as believers, as family members in the body of Christ. You know, over the past three weeks, we talked about how we um, as Christians, um, if you look at the little subtitle, how we're living hope in a hostile and hurting world. Three weeks ago, we looked at how we need to be good citizens. And then the week after that, we talked about how we need to be good workers, co-workers. And then last week, we talked about difficult, tr difficult and tricky passage about how we need to be good spouses. And in the words that we kept using there over and over again throughout all of those you know, sections was be subject to or be submissive to. We defined that last week as you know, placing, placing yourself under voluntarily for the good of, you know, for something that's greater, ultimately for the glory of God. And so today, the, the, the title of this message is, Finally, Finally All of You. Because we got real specific, right? If you are a citizen underneath the government, this is to you. And then we got to, if you are a coworker or a worker under a boss, this is for you. If you're a husband, this is for you. If you're a wife, this is for you. That's what we hit the last three weeks. And now to this week, and it says, Finally All of You. And so that's really all of us who are, still a little specific, who are believers in Jesus Christ. So here's the thing. Peter is telling us now, now that we've, he's come through some of these things about how we are to live in a hostile world, he said there's something else that's important. He says, finally, all of you, let's live together in the way that God would call us to live by, right? And so the first thing he tells us is that we are to have what I call a routine mindset, unity of mind. A routine mindset because, hey, we can look at some of these things about mindset and we can go, yeah, remember that one day where I was really loving to everybody? Wasn't that awesome? Yeah. But it's to be a routine mindset. But when the outside world looks at us, then what we have to go is, okay, how do I treat those around me sitting right here this morning? How do I treat the body of Christ? And the first here, it says this, as David just read, finally, all of you, First phrase, have unity of mind. Unity of mind is not uniformity of mind. We're looking for unity, not uniformity. I heard a phrase where it's like, hey, if two people have uniformity amongst everything that they speak about, one person's not thinking, okay? Unity of mind is really what we want to have is we want to have same mindset amongst diversity, Diverse thinking, diverse ideas, because in the church, many of you know quite well that we can get hung up on little things and for that to actually affect the unity that we should have toward one another. Uh, there's a quote, this is a partial quote that I've heard for years. I looked it up this morning, honestly. I'm like, who even said that? Uh, I think it's from some German Lutheran theologian. It says, in essentials, unity and non-essentials liberty. Okay, I like that. Because there are some things that as believers in Jesus Christ, if you find yourself in this, all of you, there are gonna be some things that are essential. Otherwise, you're not really in the family of God, right? That there is an almighty triune God who created us and then who sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins because we cannot reach relationship with, we cannot, really, we cannot reach glorifying God with our lives at all. We cannot do enough outside of the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. And that's just a few things. And then there's a lot of other things that we go, yeah, some churches believe this and some denominations believe this. And, and those things, it's like, okay, that's where we go. Yeah, let's just have liberty with one another but our same mindset 
or unity of mind is that, hey, on those core things, oh, we're lockstep. And the Bible tells us a lot of things, even with the things we get into today, about how we are to deal with each other, unity of mind, when we're not looking for uniformity. But then the problem comes in, right? So if you say, okay, fine, unity, or even uniformity in the essential issues, but liberty in the non-essential issues, and what happens is Christians start to then debate what's uni- what are the essential ones and what are the non-essential ones, right? That's where we get hung up sometimes. Uh, but let me lead you to another verse. I believe it's on our screens, John 17. It's a prayer of Jesus. Where Jesus is talking to the Father, and he says this, I do not ask for these only, and he's referring to the people, the disciples that were right there with him, physically with him. He says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who believe in me through their word, and that ultimately is us. For all of us who are Christians who believe in Jesus Christ through the words of the apostles, through the words of the disciples, through the reads of this Bible right here, for those, that's us. For those who will believe in me through their word, that they that they may all be one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us so that the world may believe that you had sent me. If you just think about the power of that for a second, that being one together as the outside world looks at us, and they do, how do Christians think about all sorts of things, right? Right? We go back to the government stuff. How do Christians go, okay, this is my presidential candidate, well, this is my presidential candidate, and I don't know how you call yourself a Christian if you're going to vote for that guy, and vice versa, and you can find people all over the map, uh, which is what I love, a sign that I saw back in the heat of the election a couple years ago where it's like, you know, it said, can we just not elect a president and all agree just to be cool? (laughs) I was like, I like it. That's not how it works, but boy, wouldn't that be awesome if we could just do that? But the outside world looks at, that. The outside world will look at how we engage with bosses at work, you know, who are just not fair sometimes. You know, you should have gotten the promotion, but the promotion went to this person who's the nephew of the boss, or whatever it is, you know, you can, there's a lot of different things. And so what is essential is that we have unity of mind, a routine mindset. And then the word changes. We get the next word here. It says, finally, all of you have unity of mind. And then here's the word, sympathy. How do you define sympathy? Unity of mind and sympathy. Finally, all of you. Sympathy is this. It is essentially like I feel what you feel in my heart. I connect with you. And honestly, you know what people need? People just need to know that they're heard, that they're understood, and that you can feel what they feel. And a lot of times we may not know exactly how somebody else feels. And, and, and it's really wrong to say that we do. Somebody else goes through some horrific tragedy that's never touched your life. And the wrong thing to say is, oh, I want to know exactly how you feel. And that person's probably going, mm, I bet you don't, right? But here it is. But I, if I can just feel your pain, whether or not I can connect with your circumstances or not, if I can feel what you feel in my heart, then guess what I'm showing? Sympathy. And so Peter says, finally, all of you, you know, have unity of mind, have sympathy. One of my favorite verses on this topic is Romans chapter 12, verse 15. It is so simple. It says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Romans 12, 15. Just stop for a second and focus on those words, the simplicity of it all. So if you're curious about how in the world can I go about helping somebody else in the body of Christ have sympathy, but then what does that look like? When people are excited, be excited with them. And when people weep, weep with them. For you know that's powerful. When somebody comes along, when you're just pumped about something and somebody comes along and they're pumped with you, oh, it's just greater, just magnifies the blessing. It magnifies the rejoicing. And then when something sorrowful happens and you're weeping and somebody comes along and they just weep with you, you know what happens then? The sorrow goes down because you are, it's a shared burden. So may we as as believers, as Peter tells us, finally, all of you have unity of mind, have sympathy. And then he moves to the next phrase here. What does it say? Have sympathy 
brotherly love. Now, that phrase could be a little tricky, depending on how you operated with your siblings, if you have them, <laughs> all right? Might be better said, have, have, have brotherly love as brothers should love brothers, okay? But that here is where we is. I like the family language. We are a family. And my brother and I, man, we got along well, and then we didn't, you know? Sometimes just like, you know, just little things happen along the way, uh, and he and I have a good relationship to this very day. We don't talk a whole lot. It's not because we don't have brotherly love, but I just know, even as I consider him in my mind, you know, family, my brother, he's my brother. And that's the kind of love that we should really have for each other. Now, going back to those toddlers that I was talking about earlier, you know what else I think is funny about the rules that toddlers have? They don't mind just calling you a name. Uh, it is funny, but if, uh, if, if they went from two years old calling you a bald head and a cuckoo banana, that's one thing. But if they're 22, mm, that's probably, that probably sits a little bit different, right? They also have these rules about what's mine and what's not mine, <laughs> you know? Everything is mine if they want it, you know? And if, if you have something and I want it, it's mine. All these sorts of things. And so what ends up happening here is this, is that what happens when kids, let's just, we take it outside the spiritual sense, where there's not a sense of real maturity and growth, it's about them. Eyes are on them. They want what they want, when they want. You know, babies, as they try to communicate, all they know how to do is just cry about what they want and hoping that the parents will figure it out somehow, all of that. But as they grow, their mind and their eyes should shift from inward to outward, and they should be able to see what other people are thinking, feeling, and what is socially acceptable and not acceptable, so on and so forth. But here's what I want you to understand this is that does not mean that we flip fully across the way and go, hey, I don't want anything. It's only what you want, only what you want. That's not what Scripture tells us. Again, another famous, famous verse, I think it is, a lot of people know it. One of my favorites, I don't think we have it here on the screen, but it's Philippians 2, uh, 3 and 4, where it says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Hear that? Pretty simple. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility... We've already talked about that, and we'll talk about it some more. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Okay, awesome. But then the next verse is also important. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. So here's what I want you to hear. Let each of you look not only to the other people's interest, but also to your own interest. You see? So in that, you'll see that you should not just go, hey, whatever you want, I just want you to have it because I'm a Christian. That's not really how it's supposed to be. Even Jesus, when he went to the cross, he did it because he wanted to, right? For the glory of the Father. That was his motive right there in that. So it, there, there is that. But let me give you another verse here. 1 John chapter 3, verse 24. It says, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. There it is, brotherly love. How do you know if you're a believer? One way is this, because we have love for the brothers, because we love the brothers, right? Or sisters. We love our family. We love the body of Christ. We love the people that sit alongside of you here this morning that, you know, abides by Christ so on and so forth. And so when Peter says, finally, all of you have unity of mind, have sympathy, have brotherly love. And the next routine mindset is this, have a tender heart. Have a tender heart. Uh, here it is. It says, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart. Now that's a tricky word. What does it mean to have a tender heart? Well, here's the deal. There is, if you look at the Greek word for that, that definition, to me, is quite funny. It actually means, that phrase, tender heart, means having strong bowels. <laughs> for real. Like, you go, what? Had in the world? Yeah, I wish strong bowels for all of y'all, just so you know. Uh, I think biological, physical health is a good thing. Uh, if you've had kids and they haven't had them in a while, you know the problems. All right, that's not exactly what we're talking about. But you know those phrases whereby it's just it's something that's guttural, you know? Right? What do you feel in your gut? We, have, we also use phrases like intestinal fortitude, that strength. 
And so it's like, it's that deep sense of, if I'm gonna be tenderhearted, it's that deep sense in my gut, that intestinal fortitude, that strength that makes me go, how are you? Really, how are you? That's a trick because you know what we tend to do way off too often is we don't have strong bowel, strong gut, you know, tender heartedness toward one another. We're just, we're happy with the fake. We're happy with the easy. Hey, how are you? Good, good. Me too. Yep, good. All right. There you go. Next. And that's what we can, that's what we tend to do a lot of times on Sunday mornings. And that's not a bad thing because honestly, you know, in this church, I, I love the way this church works is because, you know, you look at the, look at who's here at 1015 and you go, I don't think anybody's coming. <laughs> and then 15 minutes later, it's full, right? And in that 15 minutes or so as everybody moves through, you really don't have a chance for a real, how are you really? Or do you feel deeply in your gut for someone else? Because that's what tenderhearted really means. It means you mean it. I got a great text message from a friend of mine uh, probably two or three days ago. Uh, his name's Fred. I used to work with him on a church staff in Baton Rouge years ago. He moved to Florida years ago. And he is one of the best examples of somebody with a tender heart, like we're talking about here. His text message, I hadn't talked about, I haven't talked to that guy months and months. Haven't thought about him months and months. And the text was, hey, just want you to know, I woke up this morning thinking about you. Hope you're okay. Um, get back to me when you can. Love to know how you and the family are. That's tenderhearted love. And so for us as believers, that's what it's supposed to be. From our gut, I mean, how are you? And we should be able to find ourselves in situations where we can actually ask that question and have that question asked of us and be able to answer it authentically from the gut. Let me just tell you what's really happening here because we just really can't catch it, you know, on a Sunday morning very often, unless you get here early or if you linger late. But what's awesome is you should go to somebody's house and rip out baseboards and you have moments like that. You know, take somebody to lunch, you have moments like that. You know, we're always trying to, you know, usher people into and encourage people into groups. Uh, and we are still do, we're still working on making sure there's a life group for everybody. We're still working on that. We, know we, got, we got improvement to do there, but a lot of you are in what we call life groups. These are those groups, if you're new here, um, those are those groups that meets in homes, and man, they really, that's the whole point of that is really, yeah, we dive a little bit into the word, we apply the word, but we really learn, you know, from each other. That's what I do. Um, I get the blessing of doing that with fifth and sixth graders on Wednesday nights. I love it. And my favorite part of the night is not all the crazy games we play, but when, you know, some of those kids, when I just go, tell me how your week was. One thing that made you mad, one thing that made you sad, one thing that made you glad. Tell me something. And when those kids say, this is where I'm struggling, or this is where I'm rejoicing, when I have the opportunity to do what? Rejoice when they rejoice, weep when they weep, you know, to really know what's going on. Um, love it. And that's what we were to be about together. Brotherly love, tenderheartedness. And then the next phrase here, if we think, so as we're still talking about a routine mindset, the mind that we have on a daily basis, and we know nobody's perfect, we move from routine mindset here from a tender heart to a humble mind. Your version may say humility. Uh, if you have the New King James Version, which is a great version, it uses the word courteous. And just for me, that word doesn't help me a lot. Um, it's not a bad word. The word's right. But when I hear, yeah, you should go be courteous, I hear, you know, my mom saying, say please and thank you. <laughs> you know, please say, yes, please and thank you. Please and thank you. That's what being courteous is as I hear that word. But to have a humble mind is to really, we start thinking through that whole, remember we talked about that submission thing, that humble mind, humility, that is actually a mindset to where you go, man, I think I'm better than you, I think I know more than you do, whatever, and you know, I'm just going to choose to humble myself and to listen to you. Going back to those verses in Philippians that we just read, I'm going to put you ahead. I'm going to consider you, not just what I think, but also what you think. That's what being really being courteous is. That's really what is having a humble mind. I heard a phrase this week, and I like it. It said, humility is the grease that keeps the gears of relationships running smoothly. Humility is the grease that keeps the gears of relationships running smoothly. Because if you have two people, and neither one of them leans into being courteous or having a humble mind, or humility with the other, then, man, there's a lot of friction, right? That needs a little bit more grease for that relationship to really blossom. 
And so what are we to be about? Finally, all of you, brothers and sisters, yeah, be tenderhearted, have a humble mind, be courteous. That's the routine mindset. Let me just give you another verse here out of Ephesians chapter 4. It says this, Ephesians 4, 1 and 2. It says, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, this is Paul talking, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all, there's the word, humility. Walk in a manner worthy to what you've been called with all humility. And ultimately, you know what that is? That's a humility toward God himself. That is a daily mindset of bowing toward our Lord. And it's also a daily mindset of just living in humility, a mindset of humility toward other people. So we have a mindset, we have a routine mindset here that Peter teaches us about, God through Peter this morning. And then he moves. He moves from verse, and all that's in verse 8. And then so here we have, now we move to responsive movements, what I call it, where we, where we bless instead of taking revenge. Responsive movement. And that here is where do you find it. If you still got your copy of the Word of God open, um, it's right there. Um, the verse on the screen, 1 Peter 3, 9, A and B. And if you're not familiar with that, it's just the way I say it. It's the first two parts of that verse. Um, and we'll get the, we'll get the third part in just a minute. But verse 9 says this, Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless for this you were called. Let's, let's leave it right there. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. And reviling is not a word. Again, going back to the fifth and sixth grader, if we, that, word, that word showed up here a few weeks ago. What does reviling mean? They're like, um, I don't know. My vernacular, somebody's talking trash about you, you don't have to talk trash about them, okay? Don't repay reviling for reviling. If somebody's talking trash about you, you can hold back and not talk trash about them. You know, and somebody just does something evil to you, yet you do not have to then go back and display evil toward them. And so I don't know what gets you fired up. When you, know, when you feel like somebody's done you wrong, when you feel reviled, whether it be accurate or not accurate, you know, well, here's what we always talk about. The common example that you hear preachers talk about all the time, and then, you know, these illustrations I think are good because I think a lot of us feel it in one way or another. It's like what happens to you on the road, you know, when you're driving, and then somebody cuts you off or so on and so forth. Well, you know, what do you do? Somebody just really does something wrong on the road and affects you. What do you do? You know what my wife does? She talks to them. <laughs> she talks to the drivers in the other car and our kids for years. Go, Mom, why are you talking to them? Because they don't have a clue what you're saying, all right? You know, not that she's reviling them or paying back evil for evil, but you know, it's like, oh, there it is. And you know what I do? I just, I, again, I don't know why. Um, I'm sort of thinking about this. Um, I point at them. And I don't point at them with the bad finger, just so you know. <laughs> I don't do that. Because I think that would be reviling for reviling, right? I'm paying back evil for evil. But I just, you know, the car cuts me off, causes me to hit the brakes, adrenaline pumps, I just point at them. <laughs> That's all I do. I don't, even, I don't give them finger gun either. I just point at them, you know? And I think, honestly, I think it's for two reasons. One is I'm just trying to pay attention. It's kind of like, you know, telling me, hey, watch that. Um, but there's another part of me going to say, I want you to know I just saw what you did. <laughs> you know, it's that sort of thing. And I can find that tension where somebody just kind of comes and cuts in and just trying to get ahead of two other cars. And, you know, I just hit my brakes and it becomes dangerous. And, you know, you're going down the interstate and they made a wrong decision. They, finally, they found themselves in that slow lane again and they're about to get in front of me again. Yeah, chances are that's not going to happen. You know, that, that's just confession. But whatever it is, that stuff, those are silly things. But we know over and over and over again, significantly, people mistreat us. You know, what it is, it, it, it's living for Christ in a hostile world. Sometimes people will do evil to you, and they intend on doing that. That was their intention the whole time. Sometimes they're going to talk trash about you, and they don't care. So what do we do as Christians? Finally, all of you, we do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. Um, a verse out of Romans 12, verse 17, this says it again. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all. I like that verse for a number of reasons. One, it just told us what we just read. But it says, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all. And so we, there even is a 
code of conduct, if you will, written rules, unwritten rules, that even people outside the body of Christ would go, that's, that's an honorable thing or a dishonorable thing. You know, I think the, um, what is the most famous thing that happened, you know, last Sunday, you know, <laughs> the Oscars. Yep. Anybody remember who won what? I don't. I do remember Chris Rock, the comedian. <laughs> he made a joke. Uh, and then Will Smith, you know, came on up and just slapped him right in the face. <laughs> you know, that was like, oh, okay. And that just, you know, it's just in our news segments all week long. I'm so tired of hearing about it. Although I do think it's fascinating thinking through motivations, all that sort of thing. But here's what, you know, I'm thinking at that time, I'm Chris Rock. <laughs> I'm not. Um, if, if I was, and that happened to me. My first instinct was, as soon as Will Smith turned his back, I'm going to kick him right in the back. <laughs> you know? I think that's, that was my flesh. I think that's what I'd do. But guess what? He didn't do that. If you saw the clips, I think everybody's seen him that by now. Yeah, he, um, he moved on. Uh, didn't even, he didn't, you know, just, just moved on. Moved on with this thing and was like a little stunned. Um, and then I saw on the news, uh, that guy went through some comedy routine. I guess he just does stand-up comedy somewhere, and he gets up uh, later on into what the crowd that's there to see him uh, maybe a day after or two days after all this happens, and he says, how was y'all's weekend? You know, everybody laughs, and then everybody gave him a standing ovation. You know why? Because what he did, how he handled that, handled that was something that was seen honorable in the sight of all people. You see, even non-believers can get that. So for us as Christians, how in the world would we not at least rise to that? Doing what's honorable in the sight of God. And again, some people just, you know, have whatever their motivations are, but our motivation should always be, should always be, look at what Christ did for us. Look at the price that he paid. Did he repay evil for evil? No, we just read that, you know, a couple of weeks ago, right here in 1 Peter chapter 2. Did he do that? No. Did he revile? No. When he was reviled, did he repay evil for evil? No, he did not. So that is our example, and that as our power, we have the opportunity to bless instead of take revenge. Real motivation, obtaining a blessing. Here's what the next phrase says. It says, let him seek peace and pursue it. It's right there in verse 11. That's obtaining a blessing. Because here's the deal. Going back to verse 9, what it says, I told you, the first A and B said, do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless for those, for to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. You hear that? That you may obtain a blessing. So not only are you doing the right thing, under the, in the eyes of God, which should be our primary motivation for anything, the Bible's pretty clear. You obtain a blessing. And then Peter starts to quote Psalm 34 in verse 10, where it says, whoever desires to love life and see good days. And you got to stop and ask yourself, do you love life? Do you desire to love life? Do you desire to see good days? Well, he's telling us how to get there. Let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Why? For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Think about the power of that. So there is a blessing. What is the real motivation by which we would live out these things that Peter's telling us? You know, humility of mind sympathy, brotherly love, tenderhearted, not reviling others that revile us or talk trash about us, not repaying evil for evil. And what should be your motivation? Yeah, you want to, you know, you want to have good relationships with people? Awesome, you should. The real motivation is because that's what God's calling us to. And as we continue into a relationship with the loving God, crystal clear, he's like, hey, listen, you bless that you may obtain a blessing. And look how powerful it is. Skip all the way down just to verse 12, where it says, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and hear this, and his ears are open to their prayer. Now, if you were here last week, that should cause you to flip back and just read up a few verses. We're in verse 7 of chapter 3, and we're talking about how husbands should treat wives, stronger vessel, weaker vessel. It says, if husbands do not, it says, live with your wives in an understanding way, 
all the way down, so that your prayers may not be hindered. So we heard last week that if there's a certain way we treat other people, and I can't tell you exactly how this works, but your prayers are hindered. It's kind of like God going, mm, I hear you praying, but I see what you're doing, and something changes in our prayer life with God based on his word. And then here we hear it again from the other side. What did we just read? It says, and his ears are open to their prayer, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. Isn't that amazing? So when you just think about people that are treating you poorly, people that are hard to deal with, people are like, yeah, I don't even know if I even have the energy to show sympathy or to be tenderhearted. I just kind of just want to do what I want to do, whatever. Do you realize it's not just about that relationship that you have with that person or those people? It's ultimately a reflection of your relationship with God. Another quote I heard this week, and I'll, I'll paraphrase it, but it is this. It's like, hey, you know, the real thermometer is not how you act, but it's how you react. Or I would say even better so, how you respond. Because a lot of times, you know, it's like that, we get that thing within us where, we're, you know, we just react. That re sometimes reactions are like, oh my goodness, I wish I could have just slowed down just for a second because I did talk trash because I was talk trash too. Boom, boom, boom. But if I respond instead of react, then guess what? That's a thermometer. That's a gauge, if you will, of my relationship with the Lord. And that is true for all of us because the Bible tells us over and over and over again how to treat one another. What an awesome thing that we have these things before us. But what I was starting to mention a second ago, let me go back to it in verse 11. I love the phrase. It says, let him seek peace and pursue it. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Because here's what we know, even just in that, in those, in that wording right there, Peace has to be something that you go for, that you go after. It has to be pursued. You just can't just sit and be neutral and think you're going to get it. Because we know, inside the church and outside the church, what happens? We rub each other the wrong way. We say something, you know, get your feelings hurt a little bit. Or you hurt somebody else's feelings. And we need to seek it. We need to pursue it. But I also want to tell you this. It's not always obtainable. Another verse I want you to see is on the screen. Matthew 5. Nope, that's not it. Hold on. Where is it? Yeah, Romans 12, 18. Can we get to Romans 12, 18? Boom, there it is. If possible. Hear that? If possible. So far as it depends on you, live at peace with all people. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live at peace with all people. And what we are to do right there, well, so how do you live at peace? Well, based on the text that we're in this morning, you pursue it. You seek it out. You know, there's other verses. I remember there's a verse, um, I don't think it is on your screen. In Matthew 5, it says this. It says, so if you're offering your gift at the altar, or basically if you're coming to church and you're there to give the Lord something, and you remember that your brother, there's a word again, there's a phrase, that your brother has something against you, Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come offer your gift. I want you to think about the power of that. So God said, hey, if you're there to worship, you think somebody's got something against you, you know what you ought to do? Hey, just don't, don't worry about bringing your gifts. Go reconcile that first. And so you go, okay. So if we're going to seek peace and pursue it, Real life example for me this week, you know, this week, sometime this week, and if I see you next week, um, you can ask me about how it went. I'm in, re, you know, relationship with the guy that I've been helping out for, you know, quite some time and back and forth, and all of a sudden, he's, as the young people say, he's ghosting me on emails and text messages, and um, he's just vanished. And so I'm going, part of me goes, man, are we, are we cool? You know, he might have a whole other thing going on, I'm not going to assume that we're not cool. I'm not going to assume that I've offended him somehow. But maybe I did and I don't know it. So my task this week, um, based on that verse and the verses that I just read out of Matthew 5, I need to prioritize that. I'm going to reach out and go, hey, look, I hadn't heard from you. If I've done something wrong to you, if I've offended you somehow, I'd love to talk to you about it. I'm going to pursue that this week. Um, hold me accountable. Ask me about it next week if you want. Um, but here we go. Uh, one more verse here out of Matthew 5. Um, it says, Blessed are you when others revile you 
and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. And that is just another great example of all the things that we're talking about. We're talking about all these horizontal relationships about how we treat each other and all the things that we said, you know, the tenderheartedness, the sympathy, all that stuff. It is really, really, really about our relationship with the Lord. The real motivation should be, yes, have good relationships amongst others, but the real motivation is, hey, the Lord leans into your prayers. The Lord wants to bless you, right? Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. Oh, it's big stuff. And so I think that oftentimes what we can do is we can just kind of read over all this. Yeah, you know, I get up and I have my devotional every morning at 5 a.m. and I do all these things and yes, and I, I pray and, and, and then you just don't really think about how you treat other people. I want you to know it is important. We need to be the best citizens we could be. We need to be the best workers we could be. We need to be the best spouses you could be if you're married. And we need to, as we are living hope, as, as we're looking toward the living hope in a hostile and hurting world, the hope is the Lord himself, and that's who we pursue. Be these people, good citizens, workers, spouses. And you know what? Maybe love each other well as the family of God. Finally, all of you. Finally, all of us. And here's the one thing that I'm excited about, or another thing, not just the one thing. Here's another thing that I'm excited about, is that the grace of God covers it all. Because you may be sitting here this morning, maybe the Lord, the Holy Spirit has prompted something in you through looking at his word this morning and you realize you've got a broken relationship with somebody in the church. Hey, you know what? Yesterday was yesterday. Today is today. Go and be reconciled. Be tenderhearted toward. Love well, essentially. And you may go, you know what? I don't really engage people at all with any of these things. And maybe the Holy Spirit speaks to you today and says, you know what? Go and do that. For it's powerful, for it is actually about the living hope, which is God himself. So I hope for you and I hope for me that we will take the word today and apply it deep down so that relationships are better and so that we actually are motivated by even a stronger relationship with the God who created us and who died for us and sustains us, and who shows us grace and mercy each and every day. It is his example, and that it is his power within us that allows us to even, even think about doing these things. So let's give him thanks right now as our worship team comes back up. Um, pray with me. Heavenly Father, it's a good challenge that you have for us today, Lord, but he's even... Um, as I've just acknowledged and we acknowledge, you are the God who is um, it's better than anything. This relationship with you is better than anything we could hope for in this world. I hope and pray for all of us, beginning with myself, that we build our lives on you each and every day, that we would just have a routine, ongoing mindset about how we think about other people, Lord, and that we would, we would move in the right directions when we are reviled or when people just do bad things toward us. And Lord, may we always see you in the forefront of our minds. May we, may we be motivated by you to live this way. We need your help. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing.
know I met some of you uh, here this morning in this very room, first time visitors. Uh, thrilled that you're here. Let me just repeat something you've already heard, and that is find one of those uh, welcome little cards on uh, the seats in front of you. If you don't find one, there's someone a little table out there in the foyer. Uh, we would just love to get to know more about you because we just want you to kind of be in the game with us, you know, uh, so we can actually live out some of these things that we've spoken about this morning that God's spoken to us um, with you. So one other quick thing. Um, if you are have finished the fourth, fifth, or sixth grade, or if you have kids that have finished the fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, uh, consider what we call 56 camp, summer camp. Uh, there's information on the table out there in the foyer. And again, why would we even do something like that? That is to where we can actually get people together um, for a long haul, four or five days in a row uh, to really grow together. Uh, but today's the deadline where we really need to know who's in and who's not, because we can give back some of the spots if we don't need them to the camp, all that sort of thing. So, uh, so if you haven't signed up yet, but you intend to, let me know. Pick up a flyer on your way out. Um, anyway, there's people asking. We'll see you soon, okay? Bye.